Welcome everyone. We're happy to have you here this evening. I am Gretchen Hockmeister, the Executive Director of the Hotchkiss Library of Definitely. Sharon. Definitely, we've got the, we're on And video. on behalf of our co-sponsors, the Norfolk Library and the Essex Public Library, I'm so happy to welcome you. One of the silver linings of the pandemic has certainly been the increased uh, collaboration the software, between- we're getting Zoom. Um, could you please mute yourselves? Thank you. One of the silver Everybody linings of the pandemic has been the collaboration between Connecticut libraries. Oh, yeah. so I'm very grateful for the participation tonight um, of our partner libraries. So thank you, Anne Havemeyer from Norfolk and Anne Thompson from Essex. And also a special shout out to my friend Benta Busby, who introduced me to Michael so that we could host this program. Just a little housekeeping before we begin, we ask you to keep your microphones muted. Michael's going to read a selection for us and speak a bit about the book and his experience. And then we'll ask him a few questions. And then at that point, we will open it up for your questions. We have a large crowd, so please send your questions to us through the chat function and we will read your questions to Michael. If you prefer, you may raise your hand later by clicking the reaction buttons at the bottom of your screen and we will do our best to find you in the little window and call on you. So it's so exciting to see so many participants tonight to learn about the translation of the work of an author who was virtually unknown in this country two years ago and whose autobiographical text, um, the Copenhagen Trilogy, was named one of the 10 best books of 2021 by the New York Times Book Review, a best book of the year by NPR, and was nearly universally lauded by reviewers across the country. Tonight, Tova Ditlifsen's translator, Michael Favala Goldman, will tell us about the long history and translation of the three texts that comprise the trilogy. Michael is himself an accomplished poet, jazz musician, teacher, and Danish literary translator based in Northampton, Mass. He's just finished translating a collection of Ditlifsen's short fiction entitled The Trouble with Happiness, which will be published this spring. And one of those stories was recently published in The New Yorker. Perhaps you had a chance to read it there. So we're thrilled to have you here with us, Michael. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Gretchen, and the other libraries who are hosting us tonight. So here's a couple lines that Tove Ditlevsen wrote in Denmark in 1971. And this is what I translated in 2017. I feel good these days. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have a baby. I'm in love with a young man and soon we're going to have our own home. And the passage continues. I tell Ebbe that I'll never leave him and that I can't stand it when life gets so complicated like it's been recently. He lifts my chin and kisses me. It could be, he says, that if you're complicated, then your life gets to be like that too. So that's from Dependency, the third book of the Copenhagen Trilogy. Now, in this passage, Tova had just left her first husband, Vigo, after one year of marriage for a man more her own age. And Tova Ditlerson did lead quite a complicated life, which I became very closely acquainted with starting in 2016. I was on my way out of Denmark, browsing the airport bookstore, and I came across her memoir, Gift. Uh, a number of her, of Tova Ditlerson's books were being reissued because it was nearing the, her centennial, 100 years from her birth. So I picked up gift not knowing much about it, except that the word gift in Danish, when translated into English, means both poison and married. So as it turned out, gift was the account of her life from the age of about 23 to 35. 
these 12 years during which she became a high profile, best-selling author that she had dreamed of becoming. She also had four marriages, two back alley abortions, and a five-year near fatal addiction to opioids. And all this in just over a hundred pages. Yet despite all this drama in her life, she maintains the sense of humor throughout the book. And I could feel her drive for self-determination and independence and carving her way in life. And also she had this ability to expose herself so completely and raw, um, both herself and also the people around her with a remarkable vulnerability. So a little bit about her. She was born during World War I in 1917 and she grew up in inner city Copenhagen. Um, she was a teenager during the depression and her education ended at middle school. Her father was a furnace stoker and she had to go to work to help support the family. Um, so, so she was a self-taught author. She did not go to school to become an author. As a young adult, she experienced the occupation of Denmark by Nazi Germany during World War II. And she believed that her ticket out of a working poor existence would be marrying a husband who was wealthier or possibly her writing. She ended up marrying Viggo Merlo, who was over 30 years older than her. And he helped her get a break to get her first book of poetry published. And she wrote about a book a year for the rest of her life. 11 books of poetry, seven novels, four collections of short stories, uh, four memoirs and other books. Besides that, she was Denmark's Dear Abby. She was the advice columnist for Denmark's most popular women's magazine for 20 years. All told, she is one of the most important and best-selling authors of 20th century Denmark. And she had that complicated life that I mentioned. She was hospitalized several times for psychiatric problems and drug use. And she died by a suicide overdose of pills in 1976 at the age of 59. So in reading her memoir, I felt the potency of Tove Ditlausen's writing immediately, which is both her voice, her writing voice, but also her choice of subject matter, what she chooses to write about. Now she was a poet first, and that comes through clearly because her prose does not digress. Her prose is concise and precise. There is no fat on her pages. And she writes with this authority as if she's telling just the truth, nothing elaborated on, in confidence, as if you are her only audience. I, I love that strong voice that she has. I distinctly remember saying to myself, after I read the last page of Gift and putting the book down, I think I just read a masterpiece. So I, being a, a Danish translator, I looked up to see um, if the book had been translated into English and it had not, even though it was nearly 50 years old. So I applied for a grant to do a, a sample translation. I got the grant. Um, and when I'd finished the 15 pages, I decided that I wasn't going to stop. I was just gonna keep going on my own time because I was so captivated by her story and the message of her life. So I translated the rest and hope that I would find a publisher for it. So let me read two excerpts from Dependency. Maybe some of you haven't read it yet. Um, most reviewers mention that Dependency is the most harrowing and dramatic of the, of the trilogy of the three books. And so I'm going to um, uh, read from two sections. The first one is um, her first abortion. So, the birth of their first child put a great strain on her marriage to Ebbe. So when Tova got pregnant a second time, she was determined to have an abortion, even though they were illegal. 
And eventually she was able to turn up a phone number for an abortion doctor and she set up a time. I'm gonna read um, just the first line in Danish. Le in multe am I antre and go in ul scammed pair hanger o dingler in quo he lofted and virgo nervous o fornamus. The doctor greets me in the entry where a bare light bulb dangles from a hook in the ceiling. He seems nervous and grouchy. The money, he says flatly, holding out his hand. I give it to him and he nods toward the examination room. He's about 50, small and shriveled, and the corners of his mouth droop as if he has never smiled. Come on up, he says, slapping his hand on the examination table with the hanging straps for patients' legs. I lie down with an anxious glance at the side table, which has on it a row of shiny pointed instruments. Will this hurt? I ask. A bit, he says, only a second. He talks like a telegram, as if he's trying to limit the use of his vocal cords. I shut my eyes and a sharp pain darts through my body, but I don't make a sound. Done, he says. If you notice blood or fever, call Dr. Larson. No hospitals, don't mention my name. In this next um, passage, uh, Tova has had an ear operation. So, so during her marriage to Ebbe, Tova has a one night stand with a medical student named Carl. And then she marries Carl because he's giving her injections of the opioid Demerol pretty much on demand. Tova then starts faking an earache so she can get extra shots. So Carl sets up an ear operation for Tova's fake earache. And she writes, when I awoke from my anesthesia, my whole head was wrapped in gauze and then I finally learned what an earache really was. I moaned in pain, rolling back and forth. This hurts so much, I told the doctor. Can you give me something for the pain? Of course, he said, you can have aspirin. That's the strongest medicine we give in this ward. We don't turn people into addicts. When Carl finally arrived, he had his brown briefcase and inside it, the blessed syringe. And when he gave me a shot in the open vein, I said, you have to come by all the time. I've never felt pain like this in my whole life. And here they only give you aspirin. They might as well give you sugar pills, he mumbled. Speak louder, I said, I can't hear you. You're deaf in that ear, he said. You will be the rest of your life, but at least it won't hurt anymore. This lasted for 14 days. Carl stayed home from work to give me shots whenever I asked. I lay motionless and limp in my bed and felt like I was being rocked to sleep in warm green water. Nothing else in the world mattered to me but staying in this blissful state. Carl told me lots of people are deaf in one ear and that it doesn't really matter. I didn't care because it was worth it. One night I woke up and realized the pain was just about gone, but I was cold and shivering and so dehydrated I had to use my fingers to pry apart my lips. Carl got up drunk with sleep and gave me a shot. I don't know what we're going to do, he said, when that vein clogs up too, maybe we can find one in your foot. So <clears throat> I completed my manuscript and started pitching it to various publishers and I was getting nowhere. And little did I know <clears throat> that two British publishers were seeking actively a female Scandinavian author that they could promote. And they were guided toward Tove Dittnerosen by the Danish Arts Foundation. And then I was guided to these two publishers 
by Tova's Danish publisher, publisher Guldendale. So I sent these two publishers my manuscript and they had a bidding war over it, which resulted in Tova Dittlausen becoming the first Danish writer in over 50 years to be published by Penguin Classics. My manuscript of gift, now entitled Dependency, was then combined with two memoirs of Dittlausen that were translated by Tina Nunnally and published 35 years ago and out of print. And that was Childhood and Youth. So together, the three memoirs became the Copenhagen Trilogy, which I think was a brilliant stroke of marketing by Penguin to pair these two older translations with my brand new one. <clears throat> so the, the translation of a book can greatly expand its readership, especially in this case, where Denmark and Danish, such a small language, small country. And I often think of my translations as an act of service, both to the author for giving them a larger readership, also to the culture it comes from, also to the cause of world literature, and also to the individual readers that will read it and how it will impact them. And dependency struck me as more than any book that I translated as one that could really serve humanity and the US in particular, given the, the, the opioid crisis. You, I'm, I'm sure you've seen in the news how overdoses reached an all time high last year. And then here we have this brilliant unvarnished account from the inside of an, an addict's life experience, which I think can help increase understanding and empathy about that situation. Personally, I found the act of translating dependency more devastating than any translation I've done. As I worked, I, I kept feeling like Tova was becoming my best friend and confidant, and yet she was betraying me in every chapter with her self-destructive choices. By the end, I think she taught me more about compassion than perhaps anyone I know. One aspect of this is that I realized while translating dependency that I had an implicit bias and judgment about drug use and addiction and dependent behavior. Just from growing up and society and media, I had taken on the attitude that if someone was struggling with addiction or dependent behavior, then it must be their own fault. But in the process of working on this book and witnessing how Tova, who had everything going for her, fell prey to addiction, I realized that there's a much more compassionate and supportive alternative to my previous judgmental thinking. I learned that dependent behavior is a universal element of being human, which I also share, and not an individual's fault to be judged and dismissed. So this kind of internal transformation process through literature is what motivates and fuels my mission as a translator to make great writers like Tova Dittlersen available. I find that literature at its best helps to soften the shells around people's hearts like it did my own. And this helps to increase compassion, connection to others and to ourselves. So I'm, I'm really happy to announce that, as uh, Gretchen mentioned, I've translated 21 short stories of Tova Dittlersen and they're forthcoming in a collection on April 19th this year as The Trouble with Happiness. Um, I, can, uh, I can share the... This is the cover. So you can look forward to that. Many of the stories in this book um, touch on various aspects of human relationships, like how we often seek happiness by attempting to get people close to us 
to meet our expectations. I am currently working on two other manuscripts of Tova Ditlausen's writing. One is a translation of her later poetry called The Adults. And um, when that appears, that would be her first poetry collection to appear in English. And I'm also working on one of her early novels for the child's sake. So excerpts from both of these works have been published by World Literature Today. And if you look up in the chat, I have a link there to those. Uh, so you can check that out later if you want. Um, I also put in the chat a link to my website, which has various videos and blogs about translation, about the trilogy, about poetry. And you can also subscribe to my newsletter there. Um, and you could also subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, you could also follow me on Facebook for frequent updates um, about what I'm up to and the work that I'm doing. So thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. I know librarians have some questions for me first and then we'll open it up to the group. Great, thank you so much, Michael. That's really amazing and fascinating. What a journey you were on, um, translating just those hundred pages. Um, incredible, you know, when I, when I read the trilogy, the first two parts, you know, it's, it's so uh, at the end of the second part, she's going to have her first. Okay, uh, Gretchen, you're you're muted. You just went got muted somehow. Sorry. Okay, back back up thirty seconds. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know when I read when I read the trilogy um, initially and you get to the second, the end of the second part, youth, it's such a triumph for her, a victory that her first volume of poetry is going to be published. Um, and it's it's so touching how she wants to keep it a secret at first, you know, it's her, you know, it, even though she's been yearning for this recognition, she keeps it for herself. And then you, you come to the, you start the third part and she, you know, it's not very long before this downward spiral begins into the addictive behavior. So, um, how do you see those two parts of her, um, you know, being intertwined, uh, being a writer, an artist, a poet, mm -hmm. and being an addict? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, I can, I, I, I'm, I'm first, I'm reminded of a, um, of a, of a quote from, uh, I think it's from uh, from youth. Let's see. Oh, here it is. From childhood, where she she's read Gorky. She's like nine years old, <laughs> and and she's reading Russian poets, and she's so inspired that she um, uh, she's seven or eight. Sorry, that she says happily to her family, "I want to be a poet too." Immediately, my father frowned and said severely, don't be a fool. A girl can't be a poet. Offended and hurt, I withdrew into myself again while my mother and my brother Edwin laughed at my crazy idea. I vowed never to reveal my dreams to anyone again. Um, <clears throat> So, um, so Tova, like I said, she never went to school to be a writer. It almost like, she, I don't know that she, you know, she was a writer. I mean, you know, she was, that's just who she was. She was an artist and a, as a writer. And, um, and she also could see that that was not always safe. Um, and, you know, being, being poor, and being seen as um, uh, like uh, unworthy because she was a woman of being a writer. Um, I think that these, you know, that that upbringing really haunted her throughout her life. And, and that she had, she had a lot of difficulty just being herself and being her talent and also perceiving, I mean, you could tell by her writing that she perceives everything in such detail. And, and I think that was a burden for her. Um, and also a gift for us that she was able to take all of that and channel it through her writing. 
but the suffering that came with it, I, I think that is why the the drugs had such a strong pull on her because it softened the edges of life that otherwise were a little too stark, too stark and strong. Well, thank you. Um, has her reputation in Denmark pretty much, um, you know, she was very popular at the, at the time of her death, I assume. Um, and has it, can, is it continued through, you know, since then and how has the publication of, of her work in English and all this new renown in England and America affected, you know, or influenced her, her standing in Denmark? And are there other translations in other countries happening now, other languages? Yes. So let me answer your last question first. So, um, you, know, you know, English is in a, is a big way a gateway language in a way that um, the, her memoirs had only been translated in Scandinavia, as far as I know up until just a few years ago. And the emergence of the trilogy and all the um, popularity and readership around that <clears throat> um, have made it so that now the books have been sold to over 20 countries. Okay. So her books are now, because Danish is not spoken or read by very many publishers around the world. Right. Whereas English, almost every publisher has access to English. Right. So, so they can see the, um, the reviews and they can read the books for themselves and say that this is, this is top-notch literature, and then they can get behind it. But it's, in a way, books can be kind of trapped in a small language center like, Denmark, like Danish. And um, being translated into English can be a, a, you know, a liberation of the work in a way. Um, so yeah, to, the, when, when, her, um, when her centennial came up, remember the book that I picked up uh, about five years ago, some of her books were starting to be promoted. There was a small group of, of Danish uh, literary women, especially in Denmark, that were trying to revive interest in her around, the, around her centennial. And um, so we can thank them, but we can also see that as a somewhat of a symptom of her reputation in Denmark as a writer for women, um, because during her life, she was never invited to join the Danish Academy. She was never enjoyed in, invited to be part of the literati of her day because the mainly, you know, the ma mostly male patriarchal system of literature during her life saw her work as domestic and as mining her own life for her writing, which they, did, which they didn't consider real writing. And of course, the, so in the way she was ahead of her time, I mean, today we see that everywhere, that, that this, is, this, is, this is commonplace. At the time it was not, but not only did she do that, which was not necessarily accepted, but she did it at such a high level that today we can read it and say that she was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, and still to this day, uh, I think the Copenhagen trilogy in a little bit has mystified many Danish readers because like, like why? Why is this you know, women's writer suddenly blowing up in the United States? And, and that's part of my message is that she didn't just write for women. She also wrote for me and, 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 and I think all of humanity because what she speaks to around dependency and vulnerability and, um, and dependency that this is something that we all, uh, that we all can face, um, not, even though it's difficult. It's something that we all, we all need to become acquainted with. Great. Um, Anne from Essex, do you have any questions for Michael? Absolutely, I do. Michael, thank you so much for this. It's um, an, uh, an, uh, just a captivating uh, look at somebody um, that obviously a lot of us are not familiar with and, uh, and uh, terribly motivating, uh, at least for me, I can speak for myself, to want to go learn more about her. So I hate to change the subject uh, a little bit and turn it towards the process of translation and how that works as, uh, so I'm very naive about how that works, particularly um, with multiple countries going on. Um, so can you walk us through that, please? Yeah, um, so translation is much slower than reading um, because as a, as a translator, 
uh, I am being led by the text word by word and phrase by phrase, but I'm not translating the words. I'm translating the meaning and even the tone and the ambiance that the words create between the words and between the lines. So it's, um, uh, I've, I've learned that, that your mother tongue has a language center in one part of your brain. And when you learn a second language, that actually is in another part of the brain. And so in a way I'm taking in the, the text from one part and then, it, and then the meaning kind of goes off into this third place um, where words don't necessarily exist, where there's, a, a, there's emotion and there's concept. And then I'm distilling that back into English in the best way that I can using my experience and my vocabulary, knowing uh, and my perception of what I believe she meant. Um, so there's a kind of a distillation happening through my brain, but also through my body that like a, almost like an actor, like a method actor on stage needs to kind of become the, um, needs to become the character in the play so that you forget you're watching an actor. That when I'm writing, I, I need to write as much as possible as her. So the reader doesn't recognize me. Um, so um, it's a very deep reading and involves feeling as much as possible, as much as I can to stretch so I can feel what I believe she was feeling and be able to then write that. I hope so that answers you, your question. It yeah. does, it's fabulous, thank you. Did, did you um, read everything you could that she had written so that, you know, in a way trying to um, uh, know every word that she used to describe things and, and how she might repeat mm -hmm. some of that to, you know, what her favorite ways of describing things were, particularly mm -hmm. then having to work between the poetry and the literature um, did, did the poet reading the poetry help you translate the literature? So I've read a lot of her books, <laughs> um, but this is actually one of the first books I read and I've read many, many, most of her books since I did this translation. So I can't say that it helped me, um, but it did help me understand how brilliant she is. And, and it also um, gave me, a, a, you know, I learned more about her life I learned more about her different ways of writing. And I see the crossover as well. Like for example, um, in the, the story that Gretchen mentioned in the New Yorker, it's called The Umbrella. And it centers around a young woman in her apartment building who would leave every night holding this beautiful yellow umbrella to, um, to go off and actually be a prostitute. Um, and, and she, in, in, the, um, in childhood, you might remember, this is like a one paragraph uh, mention of this memory, but, in, but then she turned that into a 10 page short story, this, this woman's experience of having an umbrella, et cetera. Um, and that's actually the, the opening story of The Trouble with Happiness. So, so, so I, can, I make those connections throughout her authorship that, that something that's mentioned here might end up um, being uh, trans, you know, trans, um, expanded, extrapolated into into a great story in another place, and and also in her poetry as well. I can see experiences in her poetry, like around um, her abortion. There, um, translated an abortion poem, and I could definitely see the similarities um, of you know the, how she drew on her experience. Fabulous, thank you. I don't. I don't want to. I'm a pig about questions, so I want to constrain myself. Anne Havemeyer, did you have questions? Well, I just wanted to follow up and on your um, question to Michael about process. Um, I'm curious about. Um, first of all, I'm assuming that you read the first two volumes of the trilogy in Danish, and I'm curious about how you felt about their translation. Well, specifically because yours is paired with them as a trilogy, and um, whether that was, you know, I'm just wondering how, how you felt about those. Yeah, um, so I did read <clears throat> the first two in Danish and in English, um, I, I, but I read them after I translated Gift, 
or dependency. So, um, so I didn't, in fact, when I translated dependency, I didn't even, I, I, I hadn't even thought about that there were other memoirs. I was so enthralled with this book that that was my laser focus. So it wasn't until later that I discovered the other two books and that they were going to be packaged together, which turned out to be a brilliant idea. And I made the acquaintance of Tina Nunnally, who is a brilliant translator. She translates from Danish and from Norwegian. And she discovered Tova long before I did, long before anyone else did, I guess, in the United States. She translated those books just a dozen years after they were written. And you know, whereas you know, now we had to wait, we had to wait another uh, you know, 35 years um, before we could get all three of them. So uh, I'm indebted to her. And I think she's also indebted to me. She's told me several times that she's so thankful that I did the third book because she knew how, how hard it was to, to work on that text. And she really wasn't interested. Um, so she's, she's thankful that I was able to do that. Thank you. Should we move to questions from the uh, floor? <laughs> yes. Sure, we have a bunch. I can jump right in there. Ingeleza asked, what prompted you to learn Danish? Sure, be happy to be happy to tell you a little bit about that. Um, so I don't know if you can see me if you want to spotlight me again or whatever, but uh, when I was 17, I had the chance to go to Denmark through a Rotary Club um, a summer exchange program. And uh, while I was there for four weeks, I, I fell in love with a Danish young woman. So um, we wrote letters and barely saw each other um, for, many, for many years. Um, but two years later, I was back in Denmark to visit her also over the summer. And I had dropped out of college and I wanted to stay abroad. And she helped me to get a job on a farm way out in the country in Southern Denmark. She had to leave to go back to work in England. And I was determined to learn Danish because I needed to impress her father. That was the main thing. Um, but I also just wanted to be more a part of her life to be able to be with her friends and her family and participate with them on their terms um, as a Danish speaker. And so I dedicated myself, uh, what I, I, the, my main way of learning Danish besides uh, trying out my Danish on the, the few people who lived on the farm was I got a Danish copy of Catcher in the Rye and I started to read it with a dictionary. And I read the entire book um, with a dictionary, wrote down every word I didn't know, figured out the grammar, um, started to write parts of my letters to my girlfriend in Danish, uh, started, you know, you know, tried out my Danish language on the grocer and the farmer and the son and the farmhand. And, um, and since then, I basically learned Danish in a couple of months. And since then, I've been reading Danish books. I read Danish books for 25 years at, for fun, most Danish classics, just to kind of keep up my language because I love, I love literature and books. Um, it wasn't in, I didn't start translating books till about eight years ago. And um, that, young Danish woman and I, we've been married for 32 years. Um, and we've lived in Denmark, we've lived here, uh, our children speak Danish. And um, I was a, actually a carpenter remodeler for most of my adult life, that was my main career. Uh, and I left that to pursue translating about eight years ago. So thanks for that question. Terrific. Brad, uh, Brad has asked, I, uh, um... Uh, I am also familiar with your translation of the Danish poet Newt Sorensen. What other Great. Danish writers have you considered translating to introduce to a broader audience? Yeah, um, if you go to michaelfavalagolden.com and you click on books, uh, there's 17 books there, I think. Um, so some, some Danish authors that, um, pretty high profile Danish authors besides Tova and Knus, and Knus Sorensen, are Benny Andersen, a uh, national poet of Denmark who died about three years ago. I've done two volumes of his poetry. Susanna Borgo, I did a um, book of her essays a couple of years ago. I've done um, five books by Cecil Birkgaard, who is one of the most prolific 
uh, female writers of Danish literature. Um, so there's a, there's the whole list of them there, and um, and I I sh maybe I should add that every book that I've translated except for one has been my own choice. That is, from my many years of reading Danish, I knew who I wanted to translate. I knew who I wanted to bring into English because I felt that they were the best of the best. Um, so uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed by any of them. Thank you. Um, thank, just thank as a follow-up to that with some of the books that you've also translated, um, have you worked with the author uh, uh, of any of the authors who are still living? Have you, have you, while you were translating, did you run things by them? So, um, so my entry into translation was this, um, and that and this will answer your question. So, uh, working as a carpenter, also being a musician, I went to um, I went to my rehearsal uh, with my band, my jazz band, one night, and I was talking to my guitarist before we got started, and he said that he was really, really down. And it was because his son's best friend had died suddenly in a ski accident. And so I knew a little bit of what he was going through because about five years previous to that, my best friend had died in a boating accident. And so we talked about that a little bit. And at this time, I had been reading uh, uh, poetry and uh, essays um, uh, about Benny Anderson. So his, uh, I was reading his poetry and he had, uh, he had written a poem about death that I loved because I felt like it turned the idea of death on its head. And I told him about it, how, how he wrote that when somebody dies, sometimes they become more alive to you than the people who are alive. And I, and I made him smile and I thought, you know what, I have to, I have, he has to be able to read this poem. But of course he couldn't because it was in Danish. So I, de so I decided I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna work on this poem, I'm gonna translate it so I can give it to him. And that was the first poem I translated. So if I could, let me, let me read, I'm gonna read, it actually became the title of this book, which is Benny Anderson's poetry, Something to Live Up To. Let me just read the, the, the first part of the poem. Um, I'll read the first lines in Danish. Nå der lever op til, jeg taler ikke lige frem mine døde, Noter mig bare, at tallet stiger stødt, men hvad er døde tal mod spredt døde venner? Something to live up to. I don't actually count my dead. Just notice that the amount is increasing steadily. But what are dead numbers compared with dead and kicking friends? I have nothing against the dead. Some of my best friends are dead. What strikes me is just their unfailing life energy seen alongside numerous living who are more dead than alive. I know more not dead who bore me to death while the really dead, the professional are up and moving again at unexpected moments. So, so I translated this poem and I was loving Benny Anderson's poetry because he has this ability to be both funny and deep and serious at the same time. And I just, I was, he was just so ingenious, such a brilliant, brilliant writer. So I started to translate more of his poems in my free time, in the evenings, on the weekends, I would sit down and try and work out some of his poems in English. And when I got to like 50 of them, I thought, well, maybe I should let him know what I'm doing. Even though he's the national poet of Denmark and I'm a carpenter from Western Massachusetts, I thought, well, I'll just send them and just, you know, just, for, just to let him know. And he ended up writing back saying, he must have liked what I had sent because he said, next time you're in Denmark, why don't you come visit me? So, the next, so I said, okay. <laughs> the next time my wife and I visited Denmark, which we do about every year because there's lots of family over there. 
we we went to his house and had lunch with him. And at the end of lunch, he pulled out the packet that I sent him, and we start talking about translation and what word choices I made. And he knew English very well, even though we always spoke just in Danish. And uh, we ended up playing music together because he's a brilliant pianist as well. And I brought my clarinet. And by the end of the lunch, he had invited me to come back <clears throat> in the spring and spend a couple of weeks with him so that we could go over all my translation questions and see about preparing um, a large manuscript of his work to appear in English. And I ended up becoming both this volume, something to live up to, and also a second volume called Certain Days, um, which have between the two of them, you know, I would say all, all of his most popular poems and all the ones that uh, this kind of rose, the ones that rose to the top. His That's his, his poetry book right there. It's 1200 pages as collected poem. So I didn't do all of them, but we did quite a few. So that was my introduction into translation was working with Benny Anderson. And then, um, and then from there with my background of just re being a voracious reader, um, I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of work lined up. Yeah. That's so Thank cool. You. That's so cool. Um, Abigail asks, I haven't read the book yet, but are there nu nuances of Tove's writing syntax images that you brought into English? And could you give us an example? I think she's asking a much more, uh, my question much more articulately, so, my earlier question. Are there nuances um, of, of her writing that you could give us examples of? So I'm not entirely sure what the question is. I mean, well, one, I mean, I don't know if this, if this is part of it, um, but for example, um, there is no quotation marks. I don't know if you if if you notice that when you read the book, there's no quotation marks. Um, and so, as a uh, as a translator, I wanted to preserve that. Um, so that took some skill to to so that it would always be clear to the reader who was speaking and when the speaking ended. Um, so that was that's a nuance of her writing that not everybody does. It makes the pages look a lot more clean somehow. And, and it was a challenge for me to be able to just to preserve her style that way. Uh, I'm not sure if that is, if that is an example. <laughs> um, I wonder if she means um, maybe, or, or in addition, some um, phrasings, if there are phrasings particularly that were maybe difficult to, um, you know, in the, in the words between the lines kind of a mm -hmm. thing where, where yeah. English didn't necessarily directly um, uh, make that that phrasing clear. So I, I, I can't bring up any, I can't, I can't give you examples of any phrases right here, but what I can tell you is that if you look at a Danish dictionary and an English dictionary, the English dictionary is a lot bigger. And um, part, of the, part of that reason is that in Danish, the same word uh, can have a lot more meanings. And, and it's sort of like a, um, the, Danish, uh, um, the Danish reader or the Danish listener is assumed to understand what the speaker means because they know Danish, they know the Danish culture. So a word might be used, in the, same, the same word might be used in several different places and needs to be translated differently into English because we have a much more nuanced and, and specific word for that. And so as a translator, that's the challenge for me to not just translate the word, but translate the situation. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah. So, you know, so a word like, um, you know, you know, like ang angst, you know, it, it, it could be, um, you know, anxiousness or it could be worry or it, it, it could be hesitation, or I don't know, there's like, there's just all these different nuances and I need to figure out which one fit. Um, um, yeah, so let me just stop there. Okay, thank you. Well, you've, I think, put the difficulties of translating uh, from one language to another in a nutshell. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> thank you. Um, are there any members, uh, Susan wants to know if there are any members of Tove's uh, family still around, and if so, have, have, how have they reacted to her wider fame and her growing mm -hmm. influence? Yeah, I, I, I don't, 
and she definitely has has family, but I I, I don't have any contact with them, and I, I can't say. Um, sorry, can't, I can't answer that one. Fair enough. Uh, um, I will I will mention I mentioned to the librarians before we started that Dependency, um, the third book, is coming out as a TV series in Denmark. It's going to be a four part series. Um, I know that a lot of people have seen Born and or Borgen, whatever, um, and other Danish uh, um, mini series that have, become, that have been very popular. Uh, and so hopefully this one will become available to us as well. It's coming out next summer. It's four episodes and each one is based on one of her marriages. So it should be pretty amazing. And so if they're given, so if her family is giving permission for things like that, then I think that they must be happy uh, about what's going on. Great. Uh, <clears throat> very nice. Abigail, by the way, said, thank you. You answered her question exactly. Um, okay. Susan's asking a question that maybe we've already uh, gone over, but I'll, I'll just throw it out there is if she could read Tove in English, if, if it were, I'm guessing she means if it were originally written in English, how differently would the book feel in tone, in emotion than it does um, uh, in English? I think she means the Danish. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> so like what an English language writer, you know, how would they write the story differently? It sounds like that's what the question is. Basically. Yeah. Um, is there any, it, it brings me to a, maybe a tangential question. Is there anybody you know of an author in English, an, you know, an English, first language English author who writes at all similarly to Tove? Yeah. Um, Stylistically or? Yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. It seems unique. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, she, her, her writing style is so is so pared down and clean that I just I love it um, absolutely absolutely love it and uh, what what I partly what I love about her writing is um, is this tension that she builds up in me as the reader because uh, when she, when she is uh, uh, you know when she's when she's writing you know humorously like about you know, cutting up her husband's clothing to, you know, to make a, to make a dress for her mother and stuff like, like, like so endearing, right? Um, and, and, and I just love how she can expose, expose herself uh, and, and, and her, uh, and her life. And then she turns and she makes some really, what I feel is these horrible decisions. But to her, it's just, well, then I did this and then I did this. She seems to take herself so lightly. And meanwhile, I'm watching her self-destruct and saying, no, don't do that. And yet she does it anyway. And she can write with such lightness over such, uh, you know, over, over episodes that have such gravity. And that is this tension that's built up in me as a reader that I, I, is just phenomenal and makes, it, and makes it a joy to read and painful to read at the same time. And there's just not a lot of people that do that for me. Yeah, yeah that's a gift, truly, it's a gift. Yeah. Um, Gretchen, Pamela wants to know if the recording of this presentation will be available to stream later. Yes, I, I wrote in the chat that we will put it in the next few days on the Hotchkiss Library YouTube channel Great. So by early next week. Good. And so there'll be dozens more people who will be able to see this, which is wonderful. That's a real gift as well. Um, Kathy uh, wants to know, you mentioned, and I'm I'm going to just slaughter the last name in the in the Danish, but we'll say it Ditlevsen. Uh, you mentioned that her work has been translated into Norwegian. Do you think she influenced Knausgaard's memoirs? Um, perhaps, because I've also read him and feel that I feel like he is following in her, you know, in in her um, in her wake, you know, following in her footsteps. Um, so perhaps. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Excellent. Yeah. I can definitely, I can feel the sim, you know, I can feel the similarities when I read them as well. Although I feel like his, I feel like her writing is even more pared down than his is. But um, um, I would love to share um, the most difficult part of translating this book. Because um, I know we're 
we're running running down on time and I wanted to to share that. So um, I, I have this really distinct memory of in part two where um, I finished translating and um, and uh, cleaning up chapter five where Tova is carried out of her house after her long addiction. And she's down to 65 pounds. And she was not a, she's not a small woman, she was tall. And I think she was lucky to be alive. Uh, but she called the head psychiatrist at the hospital and he sent an ambulance and she was carried out to be driven to rehab. And I remember when I got to this point, I was like, wow, this is good and really dramatic. And I, and I called my wife and she was in the kitchen, I was in the living room to tell her what just happened to Tova, that she was being um, taken to rehab in an ambulance. And at that point, it hit me that when I turned the page to keep translating, she was gonna be going through withdrawal. And I remembered that when I had read the book, that that was, some of the most devastating writing I'd ever encountered. And that she was gonna be going through withdrawal again when I turned the page and that I was gonna be going through it with her in my own way. And I just broke down sobbing in my wife's arms. I, I, I couldn't, I just couldn't handle it. Um, and I, I realized that I had become really fragile from translating the book to that point of accompanying her in a way through all of her traumas, small and large, and, and that I had, I had taken some of them on. And I was really triggered by her struggles with love and anxiety and addiction, and that I needed some time. And I'd never done this before, but I, I, I have to take, I'm gonna take two weeks off. I'm not even gonna look at this book for two weeks. And during that time, I, I called friends and family. I set up lunches with people and I just talked to everyone about it. You know, this is what I'm doing and this is what's happening and this is what, what happened to her and this is what's happening to me. And I wrote about it and I meditated on it. And what, what I, and I started to realize some things like why was this so hard for me? And part of it was that I, I, didn't, I didn't wanna see her suffer. And I saw how she was, despite all of her advantages and privileges, um, she had money, she had fame, she had a family, she had talent, she had good looks, and yet she fell prey to addiction so easily. And it made me realize how easy it is for other people too, to seek to, seek to avoid feeling bad. <laughs> and that I do that too. And that I also have blind spots and things that I do repeatedly that are not necessarily in my best interest because I'm escaping from something that's difficult. And that dependencies, whatever they are, you know, hers was drugs, but there are so many to choose from that everybody I think falls prey to them in some way. There's a whole spectrum of dependence. And not only are they, you know, are they already there, that we have a society that in a way encourages uh, consumption to excess. That we're all, we're, we're confronted with images um, and role models that entice us to do more and more than perhaps is, is, be is best for us. And so, um, I, uh, I began to see myself more as her equal and not better than her because she was addicted. And that really helped to open my heart and make me want a society that could also be more supportive and less judgmental of people who go, you know, um, we, we have a tendency to blame people who go farther than is healthy. Um, and I wish that we could uh, spread a feel, more feeling of solidarity and goodwill and that hopefully reading this book is a way that at least some people will, will get there um, or help them to get there as you know, like the impression that it made on me. Thank you, Michael. I, I can only rephrase, Ingalisa's Tusentak, 
And um, from my part, thank you very much for bringing Tova's world to us so that we can begin to understand it. Thank you. Thank Gretchen? You. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Michael. I think um, she's an incredibly honest and generous open writer, right? She was incredibly brave. And, and mm -hmm. I applaud you as well because you're very, very open and willing to share with us. So thank you so much, much more than That's I certainly expected. I have one last question because I'm just very curious. Um, how does one find out that their book has been named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times? Do they let you know ahead of time? Or did you get a text from somebody saying, did you hear? Um, so uh, gosh, I'm, I think it was the, um, the publicist from for our Strauss and Chiru that um, that found out, found out ahead and, of time. And, and, and told me that, hey, this happened. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, and I actually have a blog about that on my website. You can read about how I reacted to this. Oh, that's great. Um, but I also want to I'd like to address what you just said, that Tova was really gifted as a writer and used that to expose herself in such great detail as a gift to the future. And, and I, I, use, I use that as a role model for myself and, and um, to challenge myself to try and expose my experience as cleanly and clearly as possible too. Um, I also, I'm, a, uh, I'm also a poet, as many of you may know already, I've written three books of poetry and it's part of what I try to do in my own writing as well, um, to expose my, my life um, in as few words as possible, just like Tova did. I, 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 I'd like to share one poem, a really short poem with you, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So, so this, uh, it, this is a title poem from Slow Phoenix. This is uh, my book that came out last year. Um, and this is the, so the Phoenix, as you know, is the, a bird from mythology that when it reaches a certain age, it bursts into flames and, and then arises from its ashes. Now this, uh, this poem is Slow Phoenix. Sometimes I feel resentful about having my problems. But as the days pass and I don't burst into flames, I'm thinking I have just enough problems to keep me moving. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for, for all of this. It's been really, really amazing. Much I, I knew it would be great, but I have to say it was really, really, truly <laughs> wonderful. So thank you. We've done lots of these, so I can assure you this was really, really a high point in our um, presentations. Thank you for, to you so much, Michael, and thank you to our um, co-sponsors, Anne and Anne, and thank you to Holly, my colleague, for helping out, and thank you, everyone, for spending part of this cold, dark uh, winter evening with us. I just want to invite you all back. Uh, think about the summer, a hot August evening on Friday, August 5th. We hope to be back in person at our 25th annual Sharon Summer Book Signing under the tents on the Sharon Green after a two year pause. So fingers crossed that it's going to happen. We are planning and Michael has already accepted an invitation to be there. So he will be able to sign copies of both the trilogy and the new collection of um, short fiction. So mark your count and maybe uh, one of your volumes of poetry perhaps you could bring along as well. So, <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, so um, mark your calendars again for Friday, August 5th. And so thank you all again for joining us. Thank you to um, Essex and Norfolk Libraries and check all of our websites out. We all have a lot of events coming up. So check them all out to see what's in the works. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, everyone.